All right, so good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us for our first uh, presentation of the RMP Summer Series. So it's good to see many of you uh, in person and um, thanks for those of us joining us online. So this morning, uh, we have the pleasure of having our very own Dr. Ali Berlin uh, present for us. So I'm going to give him a brief introduction before he starts his presentation. Uh, Dr. Berlin is a connection scientist and radiation oncologist at the Princess Mark Cancer Center, University of Toronto. He's trained in various uh, locations, including Chile, Israel, and Canada. Uh, Dr. Berlin's research focuses on the discovery, evaluation of novel therapeutics for GU cancers, as well as utilizing genomic characterization, advanced molecular imaging, and MRI imaging. He's the principal investigator of the NRG GU010 trial, which is two prospective randomized trials looking at uh, these questions of clinical genomic risk stratification uh, for individualizing treatment for patients with prostate cancer. The goal is to optimize outcomes and tailored therapies based on uh, genetic and clinical factors. Furthermore, Dr. Berlin has spearheaded a clinical initiative to quantify the performance comparing human and machine uh, learning strategies for in-house AI radiotherapy planning for prostate cancer. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Berlin as he shares his expertise and insights on molecular drift and therapy for prostate cancer this morning. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for bringing everyone on in person. Uh, it's pretty refreshing to be back and see humans in three dimensions in this auditorium. Um, so these are my disclosures. Uh, one is related to the trial that was just mentioned and nothing else relevant. These are my real disclosures. It's pretty challenging to give these rounds for many reasons. One is summertime, so the mindset is kind of a bit shit. It's a very diverse audience, so I can easily come and speak about very technical and boring stuff, but then some people in the crowd will go on to sleep. It's gonna happen anyhow, but I'm gonna to try to keep it in a way that it's uh, appropriate for everyone. The topic is super broad and deep and has evolved over the last 10 years. I'm really bad at just vomiting content. Uh, so I'm gonna to try to give you more my ideas and the way I kind of see the disease. And hopefully you can relate that to the, your day-to-day -day practice. I'm getting raspy on these talks. I haven't done it in four years, so good luck. And good luck to you that started that and put me first on, on the speaker. So I hope I don't ruin it up. Um, I always flip and start uh, thanking people. There's no room on the slides to put everyone. There's someone covered by the, by the uh, Zoom meeting. <laughs> but uh, I think it's important to, uh, to recognize people that have really uh, imprinted uh, the way you work, the way you think. And, and it helps you understand where you're at and where you should be going. And overall is uh, my family at the bottom left that they have the patients that deal with me. If you think you have to need patient to deal with me, they really need patients to deal with me. Um, okay, so this is the framing of the talk. We're gonna talk about genomically guided radiotherapy. That's the overarching uh, topic of the summer series. Uh, I found this quote as like the best memories are made on fleet flops. I'm a summer lover, so I agree with that. So I said, I'm going to include some of the flops behind some of the histories here. It's not just a fairy telling of success stories. There's a lot of failure through the way. And I'm going to divide radiation and oncology. I think sometimes we think a lot of radiation and little oncology. And I think we should think more oncology and a little bit less radiation. And prostate is a good example of that. So let's start with the oncology piece to be consistent. The systemic problem of radiotherapy, well, it's a Nobel Prize winner in the 60s that basically showed the dependency of testosterone and prostate cancer. And that became a major milestone and a backbone of most treatments in the advanced disease stage and then start to percolate into the curative space. And then for like 20 years, there was nothing going on. So I don't really know why Charles chose to devote his career to prostate cancer because there probably going on. Yeah, it was <laughs> pretty boring. Uh, <laughs> and, and then in the last 10, 12 years, things exploded, like new agents, FDA approvals, new targeted uh, therapies. So it got really exciting, really messy, and really complicated. 
So that's why I think Charles is retiring in a few years. And the disease, uh, basically what happens is that you have all these therapies popping up in the castrate resistance uh, state of the disease. Um, and they do improve survival, but they don't cure anybody. They just prolong something. And they, it, there's merit on that. But the disease is evolving throughout the treatment just by selection pressures of the treatment themselves in some cases. And, and there is also transformation of the disease and plasticity from it that from adenocarcinoma to neuroendocrine or highly undifferentiated status or, uh, uh, stage of, uh, of disease. Um, so here with, um, can we move that one to the bottom right, the, the Zoom stuff? So because there's like um, Hansen He and a postdoc st student, they, awesome, they, um, they showed that through this evolution on the clinical and histological stage, uh, the expression of proteins that are related to hypoxia starts to increase. And if you treat these with an hypoxia targeted agent, you can delay tumor growth, which is more pronounced that effect on the right in neuroendocrine stage of disease, the most undifferentiated than in earlier stages of disease. So the correlate of that and in context, I'm credit here to Marianne and, and Mike in the renewal of the hypoxia program, which has been a longstanding um, um, program at PMH. Um, probably the jewel of the crown, but everyone thinks each program is the jewel of the crown. But uh, the, the thing is that uh, we said, okay, if hypoxia is underlying this phenomenon of trans differentiation and tissue plasticity, why don't we intervene on that? Because it might be that these tumor cells, if you tackle the hypoxia element, you can delay the progression or the resistance to these new drugs that were exciting and, and available. So we created a, a study that it's about to be launched. There were a lot of hiccups because the drug went, it was gonna go off patent, the company went, it got transferred to a new company. Basically we now have support from the company and it's to run a trial. It's a two stage phase design where people who are in the early stage of this resistance to new agent, you add an hypoxia targeting agent to the hope to delay or revert that uh, progression to the first or second line of anti-androgen uh, targeted therapies. And it has a huge translational component of molecular imaging, serial liquid biopsies and baseline uh, biopsies of metastatic foci. So, but the real problem of systemic therapies, the way I see it is that I know that some people in the audience got the credit here, uh, but the, 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 the real problem here is that the focus on metastatic disease, I think, is a little bit perverse in prostate cancer, at least, because the novel presentation of metastatic disease is only 5% of the mm -hmm. patients. The huge amount of patients who end up having metastatic disease and requiring these advanced therapies were at some point deemed curable. So that's the main feeder of people who end up dying from the disease. So you really want to change the landscape. You can play around all you want on metastatic disease, but you need to improve the cure rates. And that's not something very popular to say because we're super focused on metastatic disease. And also because prostate cancer is confounded by the fact that screening hasn't shown like a, a home run in terms of changing the landscape of disease because it's confounded by a big proportion of patients who have indolent disease, that it's almost a natural condition of the aging prostate without any repercussion on the patient's health or survival. But the message here is that we should focus on earlier stages. And that's what we saw here on the MRGRT at some point. We said, okay, this should be a discovery platform. And I said this before, I drank the Kool-Aid of, um, of that strategic planning, I think it's from the 90s. I think it's a super powerful statement. And with that in mind, we said, okay, can we converge what we have a multi-parametric MRI, let's say advanced diagnostic, which we have on the same place co-located with advanced precision therapeutics. We do MRI guided brachytherapy for prostate cancer. And can we turn these into a real life laboratory where you can test new things and new ways of, being, uh, of doing treatments? So with that, uh, it's easy to convince these guys because they're <clears throat> smart, powerful, driven, Matthew Lupien and Hansen He, and we said, okay, can we get biopsies, bring them to the lab and grow them? So these are images of 3D cultures. 
of patients. And we said, we don't want a biobank. We want to get the biopsies, get them to the lab and everything. So coordination was massive, but we could show that we could do that. And you could incubate with different drugs. So now you can start thinking, it's like, hey, we can intervene here and see real life responses of real patients in small amounts of tissues and everything. But we've had huge limitations. This is just examples, but the materials are expensive. Ramping up these because it's not on a clinical trial is extremely costly in our environment. And the logistics were just nuts, was basically what's up with the postgrad student knowing when the biopsies were going to be ready because the window of opportunity is very short. The samples, the biopsy guns change the vendor. So the quality of the biopsies has been disastrous and so on and so forth. But as this was maturing, there's other people who were interested, like uh, 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 Shane showed before that he could um, understand better what are the phenomena driving the response to radiotherapy and what's happening. And there's a whole study around that. We said, look, we do brachytherapy before the external beam radiotherapy. So if we take a biopsy there, which is free, the patient is under anesthesia, we're putting needles in the prostate anyhow, so it doesn't make any tangible difference. And the patients are very agreeable to do this. If we do it the way we do, we have baseline biopsies of a prostate that has not seen any treatment. But many centers treat with brachytherapy halfway through the external beam radiotherapy or after external beam radiotherapy completion. So now if we just play around with that, we can get biopsies at different stage of exposure to radiotherapy. Again, you're not changing your clinical practice in any meaningful way, but you're thinking is how can I enable these scientists to do their good science just by spending five extra minutes in the OR. And the, what I mentioned before was like, can we use those diagnostic biopsies and use a pre-HDR biopsy? And then if we have another investigational biopsy, we can see the responses of the treatment. And we could do this even in the monotherapy setting where we do two implants separate by one or two weeks. Or we can do these in surgical patients. Sometimes patients are waiting three, four, five months for surgery. And if you say to them, look, we're going to get a biopsy, we're going to see which drug could be repurposed for your specific disease. So during those three months, you can be getting these, you're going to get MRIs, you're going to get PSMA PET, and then you're going to get your surgery. The patient will be happy. We're going to be enabling crazy uh, cutting edge science. Uh, but it has been really, really hard to do this. So this is a blink blink to the leadership here and say, how could we enable this? Because the most changing practice uh, trial in prostate cancer has been the stampede. I don't know if you're familiar with the methodology, but this is a multi-arm, multi-stage that they basically said, okay, we have a standard of care. As things are happening, there's new things that are popping up. Let's add them as arms. And we don't have to do a control arms every, every time. So now the arm A, which was a standard of care back then, still serves as a comparator for each sub subsequent arm that it's showing up over time. And you have signals early on. So if something doesn't have a preliminary signal of efficacy, you just drop that arm. They're now in the letter, I think, M or N or, or whatever. But so it, it has been massive change. And there is present of these from the UCSF group in breast cancer, they're doing these in neoadjuvant breast cancer. Again, a subset of disease, it's very aggressive disease, but I would argue it's a subset of the disease. Not most patients get neoadjuvant chemotherapy before their surgery, but we could do these in prostate cancer where there's massive numbers and it's the leading cause of mortality of men. So let's go to the local problem now, uh, the radiation mindset. And so one of the questions is how? Should we treat with radiotherapy or with surgery? And we should keep those in mind. Uh, Thank God there's a level one evidence showing that there's equipoise oncologically. So it doesn't matter which one you choose, you should choose based on side effects. And the side effects are actually better with radiotherapy than with surgery overall. Um, protons or photons, I think that's gonna be a topic that is gonna be up and coming. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever of level one or randomized evidence. I think it's a bias, most of that uh, literature, but there's gonna be four studies with some caveats to try to answer that. How we should do it, there has been an RTOG trial 0126 showing uh, that dose escalation improves biochemical control, but does not improve survival outcomes. So, but it has been set as the standard, but this was the obsession of the 90s and 2000s, how much dose we should give to the prostate and were years of effort and is actually pretty immaterial. But if you give a reasonable dose, you're set. 
Now you can compress the treatment to seven fractions and have comparable outcomes. This is a randomized study from the Scandinavian group. There's another study from, from the UK and Australia and, and Canada showing the same, that you can do five sessions in that case and the results are fairly comparable. And now there's even from the, uh, from, uh, the NKI originally a study that you can dose paint the areas on the MRI, decrease the dose to the rectum in an isotoxic approach, if you wish, and the results again, better biochemical control. So there's a lot of different nuanced way, ways of doing things, but I, I would argue this is not where we should be, we fo be focusing. And there's also who should be treated with radiotherapy and surgery. We did this study showing that copy numbers are rations on nigrine gen, which is one of the proteins of the MRN complex, which is the main sensor of double strand damage break that we induce with radiotherapy, uh, was prognostic in radiotherapy treated patients, but not on surgery, which was great. We said amazing, it makes sense because the scalpel is agnostic to DNA sensing damage and DNA repair machinery. We haven't been able to validate these and we've tried in three, four cohorts. So this has been ditched. Um, but the progress in summary in radiotherapy, I think kudos to multiple disciplines that have been involved on these. The technologies have advanced, there's more precision, there's devices to spare the rectum, there's combinations with new reagents. But I would say the physical precision has plateaued in radiotherapy. I don't think one millimeter is gonna make any tangible difference anymore. Um, I think this obsession with dose, uh, doing it now is a waste of time. So the real challenge is systemic and biological precision. And that's where I think genomics can have a role. So let's go to the local problem with hormones. So I'm switching back to the systemic to some extent. So there has been multiple randomized trials, and this is a summary of all of them. And we have shown that if you give hormones with radiotherapy in intermediate risk or in high-risk disease, you improve the, the survival outcomes of the patients. And these, again, this is only one of the examples. This is the European trial, URTC 22916, and they showed that they have better uh, survival with the use of long-term androgen deprivation therapy. And this improves control, improves micrometastatic disease, uh, and obviously improves uh, survival. Mechanisms to explain that these have been multiple theories behind it, from reducing the bulk of the tumor, so you start with less clonogens, the likelihood of total control and disease eradication is higher, modulation of hypoxia in terms of decreasing hypoxia, therefore making the cells more sensitive, or modulation of Q7 in this case, which is one of the proteins involved in double strand, uh, double strand break repairs. More refined things now that we know is that the androgen receptor is super closely related to all the DNA, uh, DNA repair machinery. So if you start playing and reducing hormones, you re the testosterone, you reduce the androgen receptor downstream effects. And some of those effects are related to how cells cope with DNA uh, damage. But the truth is like, we don't really know in the radiotherapy. It's most probably the effect of hormones if it's improving survival is because you're tackling disease that is elsewhere in the body. And that's what ends up killing uh, the patient. So some of the things that have been tried to uh, doubt is this even applying PAM50, which was used in, in, in breast cancer to cluster between different phenotypes and genotypes of disease and has been suggested to be a predictor of ADT response, again, without any further validation. This is not in the clinic yet. And now more recently, the use of AI from digital pathology to add and enhance uh, conventional prognostic factors like age, Gleason score, PSA, T stage, and now the use of features that may not be visible to the eye to add and predict the response to, to ADT large cohorts, even randomized trial data, but again, not fully validated to bring it into the clinic. So we're back into the old predictive versus prognostic. It would be amazing to have one protein that says, okay, this is what shows response to hormones, but it doesn't exist. So we live in a prognostic world where there might be some difference in those that are positive and negative biomarker, and there might be some predictive element to it. But overall, what we know is some patients do better, some patients do worse, but that better worse doesn't correlate one-to-one -one with response to a single individual therapy, at least in prostate cancer. 
So we have been using the NCCN or any risk group categorization. Uh, it's a bit unique compared to other disease sites where you use uh, basically stage of disease. We use a permutation of PSA, Gleason score, and the extent of the disease within the prostate and different permutations and combination, we cluster these in low, intermediate, and high risk, and now a little bit more resolution by splitting each of these three buckets into two buckets, into favorable and unfavorable within the low, intermediate, and high risk. So now going back to this is, okay, can we bring these new drugs that improve survival, that they're effective against the disease early on in the stage to really have an impact on the disease? So to do that, the way we frame the problem is like, there's no predictive biomarker. Most likely there's not gonna be anything on the immediate future. We still use the same prognostic indices, but, and, and the benefits of ADT are not based on, on, on specific biology, but just on the risk of these categories. But the, the trick here is saying, um, we often talk about relative dose reductions, and that's very confusing because you say, well, you increase your chances of cure by 50%, but it's like, well, it depends what my baseline rate is. It's like if you play lottery, which I advise against them, if you buy two tickets, your chances are double than one ticket, but meaningfully is like you just wasted extra five bucks. Um, so technically it's true, but there is relative to absolute is something important to keep in mind. I'm going to bring back uh, later in the talk. The other thing that is very pervasive is like once you have a new study that shows a new standard of care, a difference between the old arm and the new arm, um, the truth is that there is a huge percentage still of patients that are not benefiting from your new approach, either because they remain undertreated, the ones above the new, uh, let's say the new experimental arm, or because they did well with the previous arm. And if you add them, the new arm, you're gonna be over treating them. So technically you're really benefiting those that explain the difference between the curves and you're doing miserably poorly on the others if you just apply blanket the new treatment, but that's how uh, we practice in medicine. And in, in prostate cancer, and this is a Rachel wrote an editorial on this, the, the trick here is that doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum, if you're at very low risk and you give hormones, um, you're gonna be over treating most of the patients. And if you go higher risk and you just give the hormones, then you're gonna be under treating most of the patient. And that difference between the arms, this is the cumulative event rate of two randomized trials of intermediate and high risk, you can see that the split between the arms is pretty similar. So the benefit of applying this blanket approach is almost the same 15, 20%. Doesn't matter where on your spectrum, what you're moving is I'm under treating more or I'm over treating more patients. Um, and on top of this, to make it even more complicated in prostate because of the natural course of the disease, we know that we may improve survival and the optimum, for example, for prostate specific mortality, the optimum benefit is around 29 months of hormones. But from an overall survival perspective, the optimal duration is around 19 months. So what explains this difference is that you're curing and benefiting from a prostate perspective, but you're missing, messing up somewhere else because these patients are older, they have diabetes, they have hypertension, you lower their testosterone, they have no energy, they don't exercise, they gain weight, they lose muscle mass, they have higher glucose and so on and so forth. So there's a whole metabolic syndrome, dysfunction and impacting quality of life. So these matters to patients. Patients hate hormones, period. So if we give it to everybody, we're doing a disservice because we're not benefiting the majority and we're making their lives more, more miserable than they should be. So we started doing studies, and this was Fabio, who's now in Kingston, of saying which patients need under treatment. We pulled multiple sources of, of, of individual patients from multiple institutions, and we said favorable intermediate risk patients, the risk of metastasis and mortality is super, super low, below 3 4% at 10 years. You give hormones to them, yes, you're going to drop it to 1.5%. At the expense of 30, 40, 50% impact in quality of life and so on. So, favorable intermediate risk should not yeah. have over treatment. But those more aggressive is what can you use? What can you use that is better than the clinical prognostic indices to identify those who are 
uh, who have more adverse uh, disease and, and pathology features and, and fate of unfit if you just do the standard treatment. So this is where, again, I think genomics is, is playing a role. So Decipher is one of many available tests. It's a 22 gene uh, expression signature based on the mRNA and basically gives you a risk based on the genomic profile of that tumor on top of the, of the, of the clinical classification has been validated in thousands, tens of thousands of patients, multiple trials. And this is just an interesting secondary analysis because we're talking still about the local problem. This is the parallel of prostate cancer. And we were saying, well, you're talking about hormones of a local disease because that's what's improving the survival. And that's what we should tailor who to give it. But this study, what they did was randomizing patients to dose escalated versus non-dose escalated radiotherapy. What they showed originally is that dose escalation improves PSA control, improves uh, failure-free survival, but does not improve patient uh, prostate cancer-specific mortality or overall survival, and went back to do the cipher on the test of these patients. Caveat is that only few had viable biopsies. Uh, I'll go back, but the beauty of RTOG is that the first two digits is when the study got activated. We don't have that in NRG anymore, but this was in 2001, and this was published in 2023. So some of the archival tissue had 20, 25 years, and, and the quality of the biopsy was available in only a couple of hundred of patients. Nevertheless, there was very little correlation with conventional prognostic factors. So these genomics are not just a surrogate of PSA or T stage, and there was a strong correlation with outcomes, particularly in those that have high uh, genomic classifying score with the cipher. But most of the study, and this is a, a summary that we did among a group of colleagues throughout the world, most of the studies that have actually shown that the cipher improves the prediction of metastasis uh, across different patients treated with radiotherapy or, 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 or surgery um, because it's a marker of aggressiveness of disease, therefore a marker of how likely are these cells to migrate Ill elsewhere on, on, on the body. And if you integrate these with the classical classification, you do improve the discrimination of your classification system to predict for metastasis or survival significantly. So our clinical prognostication, the AUC is around 0.5 basically flipping a coin. If you add uh, to these and, and the NCCN, which is a little bit better and more refined, you get to 0.6, and you can get to 0.75 if you put genomics. Still room to improve, but significantly better. And you can do this in a six-tier system or in a three-tier system, uh, but basically the message is the same. What this means to patient that you reclassify about a third of patients. So presumed to be favorable intermediate risk, they end up being low risk. So presume unfavorable intermediate risk, which you would give hormones end up being favorable and the unfavorable end up being high risk. So if they move in every direction, it's not that it's just up classifying, it's down classifying and up classifying about a third of the patients. Uh, and we published here, I think we had a very unique cohort because there were patients with unfavorable intermediate risk treated without hormones. So the uptake of hormones in the unfavorable intermediate risk was lower outside the US than in, in, in the US. And that gave us a window of opportunity to say, okay, what's the prediction there of this more aggressive intermediate risk treated with radiotherapy alone? And the main message is actually the risk of that metastasis or subsequently dying was zero with radiotherapy alone in these unfavorable patients without hormonal therapy. So these it's funny because we just wrote this, but that's what we were thinking in 2008. So this is two messages can be extra extracted from these. Either your framework of thinking is correct because you're right where the question was relevant and it's still relevant because it's not answered, or two, you're super stubborn and you're just fixed to your ideas and they're not mutually exclusive. So it's probably a little bit of both. But what we said there is that you can use this as a prognostic to enhance and enrich discussions with patients. But if you really want to know how it can be counseled and how you should treat these patients, if this should affect therapy, you need to do a, 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 a randomized trial. And then you will really know if embedding this in your <coughs> clinical practice more than a carry on the cake to enrich discussion and have prognostic information that most patients, by the way, don't know how to handle it. Um, you should do a level one, but you should pursue level one evidence to, to just do this in, in the proper way. 
So it started with an email in 2018. Someone knew of the work we were doing and said, can we use this data to submit to the NRG? Natural reaction will say, well, it's my data. It's not published. No freaking way. I'm not gonna, you're not going to scoop the data. And because there was value on doing this, uh, yeah, just go ahead. And this, this is the original email sent. I had to dig on in my emails and was sent with the figures, the tables, and everything. And that led after to a whole pathway, which has been super exciting. But I said, I'm going to share here what happens when you bring these into a clinical trial, because many of us have no clue of how this happens. So a lot of internal discussion and say, is there merit on this? Will people really accrue to this trial? Once you're there, you submit it within the NRG, and then a clock starts ticking. You have two years to activate. And in those two years, it has to go to uh, NCI Task Force, which is a group of grumpy people. I'm sitting there, there, there that just, they just blast every idea that comes through the pipeline. And then it goes to steering, which is the grumpiest people on the group. And again, they blast it once they both approve and you only have two chances. So they give you reviews, you'd have a rebuttal and then you have a second one. If you don't pass, you're out. Then goes to CTEP and you have six months to write the entire protocol and then they have to approve it and then it has to activate. And all for that, you have two years to go through the entire process. Funny enough, I put the activation here in UHN because I was the PI. So I had the protocol version one, two years before actually came here. So we said, well, we have capture. We won't get institutional approval because there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen and checklist and approve. We still took a year from study activation almost from here. So it didn't matter that we submitted and everything. So that was pretty frustrating. Um, so this is the group. It's an amazing group of people, different people. We get to know people. Uh, energy, I think, is the best meeting that we have, a group we have, and meeting that you can attend in, in our field. But this is the study. So basically, unfavorable intermediate risk, very confined to a specific risk category. And within that, what's the value of genomics? And then based on your ge the genomic score of the tumor, it gets split into two studies, basically. One that it's a de-intensification question. Low genomic risk, you say, can we forego the hormones? High genomics, an intensification question. Can we add one of these new agents and really change the outcomes of the patient? Primary endpoints are both related to metastasis, so this is not around PSA cosmetic surgery, as Charles likes to say that we do mostly in prostate radiotherapy. Uh, and, and just to prove that I'm being consistent, it doesn't mean that I'm being right, that these are all the radiotherapy schemes that are allowed on the, on the study. So you basically can do whatever you want on the prostate, because the question is not about prostate radiotherapy. There's obviously QA credentialing and all this stuff, but is can we improve the systemic outcomes and just do good radiotherapy to the prostate with whatever shape or form that you're doing before. So this is the status now. Uh, it's been less than two years active. It's crazy, like how the uptake has been. Like we have completed a fourth of the trial, 40, 50 patients enroll all the time. And UHN, the GU group, kudos to Peter and everyone in the group, who've been where number one accrual big time. It's not because I've been nudging or accruing all the patients. This has actually been a group effort. And it's great because patients here don't have access to the cipher. So this was also the first time we could provide patients with uh, genomics from their tumors and um, it's, it's um, provided by the study. So just to show you some other stuff that we're working is like, well, we didn't know if accrual was gonna go well. So this is a colleague who works in Connecticut in a semi-private center. And he started these videos for educational material. You can actually click these QR codes and they bring you to a patient-friendly explanation of a pretty complex trial because you're going to do a genomic test based on that. You're going to be randomized, different drugs, different treatments. So how can you explain that to a patient in a relative easy way? And these are an amazing resource and you can geolocate where the patients are accessing these, correlate that with accrual of the study. So we're pretty excited of how these can help do clinical trials in a sm smoother way. I don't know if the accrual had been, a, I don't think is because of this, I think the trial was accruing in a healthy way before, but certainly this is helping now other trials within NRG. The other thing is, this is how QA is done in a clinical trial. This is a phase three, double phase three, over 2000 men. You get a list of your patients, your remote access, you one password though, not five passwords, like we're doing only one. 
Uh, and then once you enter, you have enter meme to review the contours and you get an Excel spreadsheet with the extraction of the DVH patterns of all the things. And then you have to score the contours and the DVH of the tumor and the normal volumes. And I said, this is crazy. And he said, can we do some research on these while we're doing the trial? And we spoke in IROC and we spoke in NRG. And what we're doing now is two things. First of all, we're dumping auto contouring on top of it and see if we can use an auto contouring tool and flag based on dice coefficient or different stuff, which contours actually need some review or more, uh, more eye, human eyes. Um, can we use rules ba rule based scoring? That's the other thing. You get a, uh, a plan, uh, you have a, two acceptable deviations, and then you have to do an overall score of the plan. Some people say, well, there were two acceptable deviations, but overall, this is unacceptable. Some other people would say, yeah, two, but it's one is in the urethra, who cares? The other one is on the femurs, who cares? So it's acceptable. So we put rules. And IROC said, oh, this is amazing. Like now we can, can we share these with other groups? So we said, yeah, sure. Like, so now we're it's potentially gonna go into a white paper. It's, it's ridiculous. Like it might end up being a white paper out of just Neil Desai who works in Texas. Uh, and he was just so frustrated. And we were, and we just had two telecalls. We came up with this scoring system and it's actually increased the agreement between four observers that we're doing these as part of the RT group. And can we someday correlate these with outcomes? I think that's the ultimate goal. Can we correlate for like agreement between observers or out of country agreement with the outcomes from the drivers? So I'm gonna move towards the latest part of the talk, but the problem with this testing is that they're expensive. So they cost about 4,000 bucks. So you say in the world may not be applicable. So our group has also, Theo van der Kwas has been at the forefront of dissecting subpathology of Gleason pattern four and saying there's a pattern called the IDC intraductal carcinoma, which is a more aggressive type of prostate cancer. And there the are previous studies here from the group when Rob was here exploring um, correlation of decipher hypoxia and genomic aggressiveness pattern, and they tend to conflow one with each other. So it might be that an H and E way of seeing the disease enhanced and look for these pattern may be a cheap way of doing genomics and directly because they tend to co-occur within the prostate. So Matt Ramotar published these in the post-operative setting and said, well, this is the framework. If you have IDC, you're already a bad actor, don't spend money, go into intensification. If you don't have IDC, then you still may have a high genomic score. So then is bigger return of, of the money. Then just do decipher on those patients and then define there if you want to use ADT or not. So instead of giving, again, ADT to everybody, you can use a first, let's say, uh, CIFR with uh, these patterns and the second one with the genomics that are more expensive. So we put a grant and we got it from the PCC at the time. Now it's cancer... Uh, uh, um, Canadian Cancer Society uh, of using IVC, how to detect it better. And this is where everything started, actually. This grant, we put it before the pandemic in 2017. And this was a concept that we were maturing for years. And when I was doing the fellowship, we put a protocol around this of using some predictive marker and stratify for surgery alone or surgery with hormones, very similar to now the NRG trial. And this is, was the Envision trial on that grant. That we said, okay, we're going to do SBRT plus second generation ADT, which is what I showed before, LHRH plus one of these androgen receptor targeted agents. Um, and based in the presence or absence of these, because they're more or less aggressive, you can expect different benefit of the hormones and then inform a phase three trial, which is leapfrog around these with the cipher, but fundamentally the same idea. And we aligned Bayer to support with the drug and Boston Scientific to support with rectal spacer for all the patients on the trial. And it was all ready to go. And then COVID hit, delays on the activation, patent of daralutamide going off, patent at the expected readout of these studies. So they drop. Boston Scientific also find an excuse to drop. So we had to reshuffle this study. And now we're doing it on surgery. So these are surgical patients it's led by, by Neil and, and the group, and there's multiple other uh, centers that are, uh, are 
tempted to, to participate, but basically surgery plus minus second generations, and we're using aviratron because it went off patent in the meantime, and there's a generic formulation. So it could be the first trial that shows that patients manage with surgery, they also benefit from hormonal therapy because most of the studies of hormonal therapies in surgery were done back in the day when the patients who got surgery had very, very low risk disease. So there was no benefit to them. But now that they're more aggressive, there might be a rationale to say, well, if they have micrometastatic disease, they, the effect of the hormonal therapy should not be fundamentally different from the effect of the, in, in radiotherapy treated patients. So I always like to think, okay, uh, we've done a lot of work, a lot of things, incorporation of genomics can be done. So what has been kind of the journey? So there's so much opportunities to do this stuff. Even I show you, even within a trial that you're in the autopilot phase, the trial is running as we speak. I don't have to do anything besides answering a few emails every now and then now. But it's, uh, there's still tons of opportunity. Less planning, like these all, it seemed, I put it as a storyline, but it, it really happened kind of organically, serendipity, lack, call it whatever, but it was just like work, get it done and share. And just saying, if you fail, really tweak it. Like you get sponsor of the thing, there is now a generic. You, Boston Scientific said, okay, forget about us, we're leaving, change to surgery, whatever. Collaborate, share the data. We don't need more silos. I think there's that mentality is, is shifting and just walk the talk at the right pace. I think everyone walks the talk, but some people walk way slower than they talk. And that lag, many people cannot connect them and say, you're not walking the talk. Yeah, you're just walking, but it's like, I'm just doing now what I said five years ago. So it, it's just that try to keep the right speed for both things. So just summary of the topic. So under an over-treatment remain perversive. And I think over-treatment, most of the time, we're so focused on treating, 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 that sometimes we say, maybe we're over-treating. The use of omics in radiation is lagging, but I'm going to be provocative and say, that maybe that's not too bad. At least in prostate, we should use omics in oncology more than in radiation. The true north should be clear. You can enable, do translational research, figure out new proteins, new expressions, new epigenetics, and so on. But the true north are the value of care, and that's clinical outcomes and cost. I haven't entered the cost piece, but clinical outcomes, and outcomes are the therapeutic index. It's not just cure, it's also toxicity. Great to improve survival, but you want to cure patients. We're in radiation oncology. It's an amazing interface. We see patients throughout the spectrum. Surgeons see only curative patients. Medons see only palliative non-curative patients, mostly. We see them throughout the spectrum. We can translate truly advanced therapies into the curative space. And people working here is like still super poised to leapfrog uh, in this field. So just to be consistent and look back to the gratitude slide, I hope it makes some sense of the past. Peace doesn't may, mean ease. Uh, so hopefully it gets you moving. And in terms of vision, we can refine it and enact it uh, together. So thank you very much again for the invitation. I think we have some time for questions. Thanks. If not, I will start off with a question Thanks for that, uh, Ali. Um, so I know that your other area uh, focuses in machine learning and AI. Is there some sort of integration of the two that's in the works or what's the role of, of that uh, when it comes to genetic guided prostate That's a good, uh, so now it's very conflicted area because as there's people who are more invested in AI, there's people more invested in the genomic space or they already have their tools and tests um, so the ideal thing would be collaborate and try to run both. Interestingly, the Cypher, they get two h and &E slides for each patient that they run the test on. So they have archival slides that they could scan and run other companies' AI algorithms. But then you enter IP stuff and things. Um, I, the, the true underlying question to that is like how much precision you need. Like there's never going to be that AUC of 1.0. That just doesn't exist. We will still going to over treat and everything. It's just at what point you should just bring these to a clinical space and test it and say, okay, we did improve. We select our patient better and go out. 
Um, of course, you can use AI to use uh, now clustering within expression genes, and you can use different methods and apply one method to the other. I don't think the secret sauce is there anymore. I, I just think we need to move on, test it in the clinic, and change a little bit the way we do things, and then change it again. That's my bias. I think it was. Yeah, I, I don't know. You can, yeah, you yeah. can choose. Yeah, uh, that's right. Thanks, Dolly. That was a great talk. I was curious, you know, I like your thoughts, you know, the study job design is great. Uh, I was curious your thoughts on how you use maybe genomic classifiers. Is there a way, or is it being used in no treatments at all, increasing the proportion of going active surveillance, the proportion that this is part of, as you said, the natural aging prostate? Is there a role in that as well, moving even further towards no therapy at all and preserving essentially survival? Yeah, um, that's for a whole talk actually i'm in the middle of a we're a group of four musketeers with scott egener matt cooperberg and andrew vickers so ucsf chicago and memorial statistician and urologist and we said gleason six should not be called a cancer even like that should be the way of breaking the the whole over treatment stuff you don't need genomics you don't need anything the mortality metastasis rate is basically zero so you're over treating everybody um, it's not very popular, but it's getting momentum now very interestingly. Um, so I don't think we need to spend more money or more tests on that space. That's my bias. It's for sure, in the intermediate risk, there are some patients where you should move to surveillance, and that's where genomics can work. But I think the first big thing is say Gleason 6 is not a cancer. Yeah, it can coexist with Gleason 7 8, but that's a sampling error. It's not a biology element of Gleason 6 itself, which should be called asking our pro proliferation or whatever naming you want to you want to call it yes so Ali, um first of all congratulations on the nrg trial which are like initiating and getting those trials going that's just a huge undertaking and if i understand it correctly the randomization is between sort of a biomarker driven driven approach to yeah thanks um to uh, hormonal uh, therapy versus the conventional approach to deciding who gets hormonal therapy is that so so what we did is say we the the um, it's basically two studies so what you use is use the cipher to know in which study the patient enrolls and then the study each one is a conventional arm which are arm two and one at, at the bottom which is radiotherapy and six months of hormones in those decipher low, you have an investigational arm, which is no hormones. In those with decipher high that go into the intensification study, it's the addition of a new hormone. So we're not testing the predictive value here. Mm -hmm. We will have interaction testing and everything, but you use, if it's not a stratification, we use the decipher to an allocation tool to which study goes. If metastasis is not inferior in the arm one, in the study one, means that you can use those with low decipher and omit hormones at a very, very low price to pay. If the study is positive in the intensification, it says that those that have high decipher, they should use the new investment. So they're powered separately. They're like, it just, you have to play. If the complexity of this trial was that you had to play with an assumption of which proportion of patients are going to have which decipher score. Because if not, you may end up with an imbalance that one of the studies accrues super fast and the other one is lagging because you assume, let's say, 60-40 and in reality is 80-20 and it has not happened. So we have monitoring of that. The other thing that the study allows, and I think this was a good maneuver in hindsight, it was that in the US, you can get deciphered commercially. So you can get the decipher, and if you know your score, you know in which arm you're gonna go. So it's a two-step registration. You can come at step one without the cipher. That's all the Canadian patients. You get the cipher as part of the study, or you can come at step two, which is after you get your score and the stratification, you get randomized within each of the studies. Um, so, so yeah. I, I, There's no arm in the study where people are blind to the cipher score. No. So you, so you can't isolate the impact of using the cipher score to, to 
long-term advancement versus a conventional set of risk factors? No, no. We, but you can. What you will able to say is like after the study, between these conventional factors and the cipher, we can treat you this way or that way. So clinically, resolves it. Uh, secondary endpoints will have all the we will be able to compare all, all the arms, right? So there's a lot of stuff that can be done here, but that's more for a hypothesis generation. So and sorry the, the conversation. So uh, so the on the treatment modification, and you alluded to this is hormone therapy, right? And and radiotherapy you can do whatever your institutional preferences. So and you sort of mentioned that this do you think like the days of Tinkering with the radiotherapy dose of volume and prostate cancer are are sort of over, and that the because here really it's a drug, it's fundamentally a drug trial, not a radiotherapy trial. So I guess my question is, what does that? What are the implications for radiation oncology practice? How we're training residents and fellows? Or should we be training them more about drug therapy than about whether it makes a difference what the PTP? Models? I think so. Yes, I think we should be more in the drug space. A hundred percent, because as I said, we're in the spectrum of the disease, and if you want to really change disease like trajectories, you need to bring them to curative space. So you need to manage. I mean, we prescribe these drugs in patients that recur. So we have experience with enzalutamide, aldrazone, and daraglutin. So these didn't. These are all our oral agents, so that also helps. But um, I think we should think more as oncologists than less as radiation. Uh, that's my bias, uh, but that it's reflected on the trial, I think. I think David had. Yeah, so that's a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, I think Rebecca had a question in the chat. Uh, HR and absolute benefit. Can you come in and understand the patient perspectives on trial? Oh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a great question. So this was a very easy sell. Of the of the of the trial because there's in NRG there's two patients advocates in task force there's two patients advocates in view steering there's two patient advocates so and they're asked all the time it's not like they're just sitting there like uh, to check a box they truly ask if like this is a problem and hormones are the problem like men hate hormones it just so so it was a very easy uh making it meaningful to patients was intrinsic to these to these studies but yeah the patient perspective is there obviously there's quality of life and things like that in the study um and and even further initially our co-primary endpoint on the de-intensification trial was metastasis rate and a quality of life outcome and geosteering got very annoyed by that and it didn't fly. So we have to risk, like we couldn't risk the passing the trial, having a primary endpoint that was quality of life, which is a bit uh, false about the oncology problem that most of the studies in metastatic state is all about improving survival because that's how drugs get approved and that's how they make money, which is fine. Um, like, that's how progress is made. but. There's a huge bias of, of having a quality of life endpoint as a primary endpoint of a, of a study. So I, I think the patient perspective is super on the trial and it should be way more and we should have clinical outcomes that matter to patient more than regulatory agency. Great talk. Um, you talked a lot about at the very beginning kind of working with the biomarkers to identify patients for surgery or for radiotherapy in the definitive state. And you spent most of the talk about you know, plus or minus hormones. I mean, what are your thoughts about kind of going back to the original question and identifying you know, biomarkers that can help decide whether radiotherapy or surgery is the best curative treatment? Yeah, so uh, that was um, that was my original space of interest. The the truth is that I may have a slide. I think I have this slide. The truth is that um, the the end the results of radiotherapy or this is the the patients and the, the, I don't have the survival here. The survivals are extremely high. So it almost doesn't matter which treatment you choose from an oncologic perspective. So all the clinics revolve around toxicities and likelihood of adverse events. 
So if we were to have a marker or choosing one, I think it should be a marker of likelihood of toxicity more than a marker of tumor control. And that may be a very interesting space because if you have something that predicts rectal bleeding or predicts dysuria or predicts incontinence in men, there you start, it starts getting complex because it's not just biology, there's yeah. healing processes, there's inflammatory pathways, there's quality of the surgeon in the case of surgery. So it's very hard to think that you won't have noise on that, but there might be some toxicities like rectal bleeding or stuff like that, that they're cleaner in terms of a, a rectal bleeding cleaner is an oxymoron. But I would I would say that is a it's 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 easier to find a correlation that is meaningful and real more than the noise from all the other stuff. And there the final mark would be normal tissue or genomics yeah. of the patient, not the tumor. Yeah, and makes it easier, right? Like yeah. then it's could you just blood germ lines or uh, SNPs? I think they're all, like I think SNPs is a is a rabbit hole, but maybe something on the normal or maybe the normal is also we don't study that much like special heterogeneity of normal tissue and genomics. Like no one is doing mapping biopsies of normal rectum and comparing if they're truly the same. We assume all the genome is the same, but is the methylon the same? Maybe there's a signature there. Who knows? Like, I, I, but I do think in normal there might be way more meaningful, at least in prostate. Other diseases maybe it's different. Yeah. Uh, you presented lots of data, and I'm trying to wrap my brain around the, why do you say that radiation dose and technique that doesn't matter? Because it showed a number of studies that showed quite a difference between, you know, 79 grade versus 70 grade. So are you saying that as long as you're doing the, the yeah. better of the two arms with the modern, modern uh, knowledge uh, and the better arms, it doesn't matter? Or yeah. are you saying that it doesn't matter in general? So I did it, I said it's provocative and mm -hmm. I know land might be different than prostate. So that's one of the things. So, but I would say two things. They do have differences, but that's in PSA control. And PSA control, there have been like lots of studies. There's a whole initiative called ISCAP that they said, well, it does biochemical recurrence truly predict because it's a slow, slow paced disease. You may have biochemical recurrence, but never had a metastasis because the disease is slow paced and the patient dies before something happens. So biochemical recurrence is not a surrogate of overall survival. So we know that. So in terms of living longer because you control the PSA better, that, that's not true. But on the other hand, some people argue, say, well, biochemical control is still relevant because if you have or not recurrence, the patient might be more or less anxious, more or less worried, and depends how things are perceived. So I don't, I'm not saying there's no value there, but I'm saying that it's getting saturated of what really meaningful delta you're achieving by adding four, five, six grades. And I think we've plateaued, at least in prostate. So as long as you're giving some reasonable dose, uh, what you may gain by giving extra dose or shaving one milliliter of the PTV is nothing compared to what you can gain by, in this case, adding or avoiding hormones. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not, I did not say like, oh, just give, let's give zero grace to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, great talk. Congratulations. Thank you for automating this with a QA for every couple of weeks. Um, and, and normal tissue, I'm glad you mentioned that in the therapeutic ratio, and I think it's way understudied. Are the quality of life tools sensitive enough to really um, measure uh, meaningful differences for patients? We just, it's funny, like it's how topics come from. We just had on the Gleason 6 that we were discussing. Yeah. Many of the anxiety and depression, for example, tools are for clinical anxiety and clinical depression. So they're not really sensitive for, I don't know, like rumbling around the idea and being a little bit worried about that you're not having overt anxiety or, or a DCM4 or whatever number we're at, uh, a depression disorder. Um, so I don't think they're sent like I don't think they're sensitive enough for many of the toxicities. The problem you get there, and we have had it with PROs and staff initiatives, that you you have people who are very into PROs and they're very like they're zealots of the PROs, which is good because they move the field forward. But then you have people like me who said I don't really care if it's truly validated. You can reshuffle the orders of the questions and then they say, well, it's not validated anymore. So. 
getting robust measurements and sensitive enough sometimes are clashing each other because you want the robust ones that detect the big stuff because new one stuff then they say well there's too much noise variability and stuff so they don't pass the quality on the pro element but then you end up with this problem that you have high quality tools but very limited meaningfulness in the clinical day-to-day -day practice so Again, huge space for someone to tackle in and, and say, okay, how can we create better tools? Does it really matter if you reshuffle the questions from a meaningfulness perspective? Great work, thanks. Well, thanks everyone. <laughs>I wanted to thank uh, our speakers and the audience members today. Ali, you definitely are someone that walks the talk. Um, and uh, we will uh, I look forward to welcoming you in a couple of weeks for the second session. <laughs>